Greetings friends, welcome again to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. Our Lord Jesus Christ, He is our Sovereign. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ. And it is His Holy Word, the Bible, the doctrine of God that we are to teach and declare the all things of. We thank you for watching our videos, taking time out of your busy day. And we pray, I pray. That the Bible studies and history studies that we're doing would be a blessing unto those that are following along. And if you're a new viewer, we encourage you to like and uh, follow our YouTube and Facebook sites. And uh, we have many other videos and things which we share there on Facebook. And even though Facebook it does work against us, as I see it even working against other preachers and churches, that we hear of from time to time. Facebook is no friend of the truth. They hate the truth. Not this political truth, but religious truth. They, ha they hate the truth of God and they oppose it. And uh, we seek to set these things before the people of this world while we still yet can. We are continuing here in our study in the Word of God of the, the three that bear record in heaven. Those three that Scripture say are one, that thrice holy God, the Trinity, which is firmly set and taught to us throughout the Word of God. And again, we direct your attention to 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 1, where again here it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him begot, or love him that begot loveth him also, that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. One God and three persons. And those three persons do bear record in heaven of our salvation, and of our life, and of our tears, and of that which God hath called us to do, to be a people unto himself. We are looking at the 49 times where Jesus speaks of his Father. And we are on number 5 now, and we pick this up in Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 26. Where he says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. It speaks of our Lord, the Lord himself, and we saw one of those last time there where it speaks of the Lord sitting on his throne of glory and reigning and ruling and passing judgment. But here he sits and speaks clearly of his Father's kingdom. His Father's kingdom. And all creation, my friends, all that exists is His kingdom. It is God's kingdom. And He being that supreme power, that supreme authority, the sovereign over all that exists, has set forth and created principalities and powers within this kingdom of His. Just as in any kingdom, in a vast kingdom of a ruler, you would have uh, governors and different ones and 
uh, different levels of government and different levels of ones who are under you that do your will and do your bidding for, uh, you know, you would think of this aspect in an earthly sense, uh, a great king on the earth, he could not be all over his kingdom, especially in the days of old. Uh, you go back to, oh, uh, uh, it was the Caesars or any of those old kings that are even spoken of in the Bible that had uh, those kingdoms that existed in their, the regions in which they controlled. Well, there would be the cities and regions where, you know, they would set up governors and different ones to be over them. You'd say, well, we know that God is omnipresent, so how does that apply to him? Well, God did not have to create these principalities and powers, but he did. And Satan, being cast down, He's allowed to be here and be the prince and the power of the air. God's allowed him to have that low position that's just beneath him. And he, you know, Satan believes he's going to rise above God. And God says, oh, there, there's this earth. There's this planet. You go and uh, manipulate the airs and the winds and just see how much difficulty it is to control these things. And I'm sure that even if Satan, and God, he does, as we see by the example in Job, he has to approach God's throne and say, let me go here and bring forth this disaster. And let me show you how the people will curse you, God, and how they'll turn against you, God, even your people who look to you by faith. Let me show you what I can do and how I can tear up their lives and make them look to you. Or make them, uh, well, Satan believes will turn against God. He believed Job would curse him, but he didn't. And all of those who truly believe upon God, their faith is in Him. And even through all the trials and tribulations and things that come upon us in this life, we are caused to look to Him with even more assurance and faith that God is with us and He brings us through these things when they come upon us in this His kingdom. Unto men was given this earth also, that we might reign and rule over it and all that life which is in this world, whether it be the plant life and the trees and these things are for us, for our benefit, and all the living things are in this world for us. Uh, we're not animals like all the other animals in this world that exist. Those things are there for man to be used of us, to be enjoyed by us. We are the higher life form in this world. There's also the angels, and we spoke of Lucifer, but, <coughs> Lucifer. <coughs> but there are also those angels, which are principalities and powers also, who, as Scripture speaks of many things that they do, one is that they, be, they watch over the children. They watch over the children in their youth. And as Christ spoke of that and said, They behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. Those angels watching over children to keep them and watch over them, and yes, some are allowed to die. Many millions are being allowed to die. They have been for many years. Even here in our own nation, many millions of those children have been allowed to be slaughtered and cut right out of their mother's womb because of the foolishness of men and how that we have denied God and denied that man is even made in the image of God and His likeness. We're not animals. We don't... And the animals don't go out and kill needlessly. They kill what they need to eat every day. They don't go out just to slaughter a whole bunch of animals in their area of, of influence. Just because they're there, let them lay around and rot and be there. Like man does, we go forth and we kill and steal just to have and to get more. And we have no respect for life. God's kingdom. God hath ordained the powers to be, whether it be the kingdoms of men or the kingdoms of animals. Because of the fall, because of sin, because of the breaking there. And you can go back and look at it and you can see there before the flood, scriptures imply that men did not eat meat. And there was a relationship between man and the animals and this world that we had then that we don't have now. But after that flood, the animals began to prey upon one another. Man began to prey upon them because he said, here, you can eat of these things. 
And they began to, to fear man. And yes, they prey upon man at times, the big animals, the cats and things. All a part of this kingdom of God. God having ordained the powers to be and set them in place. And he says, those that resist the powers that be resist the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For there are those higher powers, even of God himself, and to deny that God is over us and has power over us is utter foolishness. I want to say to you, you ones that want to believe that, well, you can say no to the salvation of God, let me say to you that when it comes time and you stand before the white throne judgment of God, you're not going to be able to say no to his judgment. But you will bow the knee to him, and you will acknowledge that you did not believe upon him. You refused to believe upon him. Yes, you would not believe upon him. And you're going to be found guilty, and you will acknowledge his righteous judgment, that he is righteous in all his works. You will acknowledge there that he is righteous. He was righteous to choose a people unto himself, because you would not come unto him of your own free will. And if God did not effectually draw some unto him, no one would come unto him. That's an absolute truth. <sighs> Praise be unto God. He has saved a remnant for his namesake. The rest are blinded and dumb, and their hearts are hardened, and they will not come unto him. It is God's kingdom. He is the sovereign over all existence. The Holy Spirit reveals unto us his Son, whom he sent to save and to redeem a people unto himself. And that Son, that only begotten Son, reveals unto us the thought that we should believe upon him even as we should believe upon his Son. Number six. Again, on down here in Matthew chapter 26, and we'll go down to verse 36 here where it says, then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray ye, and pray under. While I go and pray under. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. That hour is coming upon him. That hour of his crucifixion of his death and for this very hour he has come then saith he unto them my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death tarry ye here and watch with me and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying "O oh, my father if it be possible let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And I believe that was as far as we had to go with, uh, let's check here. Back, turn the page, yeah. Right there. He said, and he went a little further and fell on his face, praying, prayed, saying, Oh, my father. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He very clearly shows us that the Father's will and His will are two separate wills. His will is, though, to do the will of the Father that sent Him. He's a separate person. He has a will of his own. And he came and in meekness, even as a lamb done before his shearers, he came to, this, to, to do the will of the Father which sent him. He shows us that there are two distinct persons here. And this here thing, what is he, he's speaking of, he, he, he's not saying, I don't want to go to that cross. I don't want to go suffer and die for my people for that it is this very hour which he has come for and which he has fulfilled all things for fulfilling all the prophecies 
which had pertained unto him up to this point, and he will continue to fulfill them as he goes on. He's not saying, I don't want to do this. But understand and know this, that he is the only begotten Son of God. He is righteous. He knows no sin. He has no sin of his own. He's the righteous Son of God. He has only righteous thoughts. There will be no lustful desires within his mind toward any woman before his death or even afterwards. That movie that was made years ago was blasphemy. And if our Savior could have such desires toward any woman, he would not be our Savior. But understand this, that he is righteous. And God cannot desire iniquity. He cannot desire wickedness. He cannot think upon these things and be God. Because he is righteous. He can only judge sin. But this cup, this cup, that if it were possible... If there were any other way, he'd let it pass and do the other way. If there were another way, there is no other way to do this. But for him to take the cup which represents our sins and take it unto himself, and he who knew no sin would become sin for us. Take upon him our sins and bear them to the cross of Calvary, and they're going to come get him shortly. And they'll try him secretly. They will eventually pile up and say, yes, go on. You know, because they, they won't be reasonable. They say, there's no fault in this man, but they say, no, I'll crucify him, crucify him. I find no fault in him, he'll declare. They say, I'll crucify this man. Pilate washes his hands, saying, I won't take no responsibility for this. You want to crucify him, crucify him. That's the baptism also that he spoke of that he was going to be baptized with. And those two that he said, are you able to be baptized, to drink the cup I'm going to, be, I'm going to drink, and be baptized with baptism I'm going to be baptized with. He talked about suffering the agony and torment of death as they're persecuted, and as they too will be killed and buried in this earth, even as our Savior will be tortured, humiliated as they uh, blindfold him and hit him and it's all prophesying, tell us who hit you and as they put the thorns upon him, as they spit upon him as they take the cat of nine tails and they whip him, ripping the flesh from his back and where were those pieces of, th of stone and, or metal or bone would dig into his flesh and rip it out it's a very gruesome scene what our Savior is about to go and endure here for his people. And how that he has come and he being the righteous son of God who has no sin of himself, he has no desire to commit sin, he has no sinful thoughts toward anyone, no malice, no hatred, no envy, no lust, not any of the sinful emotions which we as mankind have. But this cup, that he will take, the cup that is our sins, take it unto himself, and bear it on that cross, and there receive the wrath of God poured out upon him, and there he will suffer a time of separation even from God the Father himself, as God the Father who has watched and looked down upon him, who has said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. Will turn his back and look away, my friends. During that space of about three hours, when there is darkness upon the earth, and he will cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there are times in the life of each of us as Christians. 
When we feel like God has forsaken us, He's left us to ourselves, we feel all alone, we feel vulnerable, we don't know what's going to happen come upon us next. And we're caused to wonder and to worry. But all we need to do is look back to His Word and we find strength. We find the assurance that He's there with us. That He's always present, watching over us. The God of our salvation, who sent His only begotten Son to the cross of Calvary to suffer and to die for us, to redeem us from all our sins. Yes, He knew us by name. When He went to that cross of Calvary, He knew me. He knew me in particular, and He knew you if you believed upon Him. And if you want to cast that aside and don't accept it and receive it, then that's your own loss. You brought Him down. You made Him less than what He is. He is the all-knowing Son of God. So all oh, but He didn't know when He's coming back. That doesn't mean he's not God. It doesn't mean he did not know exactly who he was going to the cross for. And he certainly knew what he was going to bear there. He was going to take upon him our sins. He who is or was that spotless Lamb of God there in that time. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will but as thou wilt. He's saying, I have a will. I have a will of myself, of my own. But it's not what my will is, not what I would say, but Father, it's what your will is. Two distinct persons. Two distinct wills. But we know that the fullness of God, of the Godhead is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all working together to fulfill the plan and purpose of God to fulfill the righteousness of God and they will fulfill the wrath and judgment of God too upon the wicked in the end of all things. My friends, we have set before us a great salvation and to those that will believe upon him there is the full assurance of this salvation that it is eternal, it's everlasting once it is yours, once you have truly believed upon Him. And that's not as one who would say, oh, you know, I believe, in, I believe Abraham Lincoln really lived and existed. And I believe some of that history that's recorded of him. Some of it may be made up. I don't know about all that. But just because I believe in Abraham Lincoln doesn't do me any good. Or anyone else in history. Of all the great leaders and all the great men and women even in history that you could look to and say, well, look here, what an example this person was and look what they tried to do for mankind. None of them, all of them, even all of them together do not equal what this one man did to redeem a people unto himself. And was he successful there? Oh, there are some that say, well, he couldn't know then. He couldn't know. But he had to wait, sit back and patiently wait, worry and wonder, will anybody believe today? Will anybody come unto me today? Well, that's just utter foolishness. He's God. And his, the Word of God tells us that before the foundation of the world, even as we saw it last time, or up here, up here in the previous passage, that he prepared a kingdom for us before the foundation of the world. The Bible tells us that he wrote down a list of names before the foundation of the world. The Bible tells us before the foundation of the world, he planned and purposed our salvation in through Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, who would come into the world. Nowhere does it say he condemned anyone before the foundation of the world. Satan's not sitting on the sidelines doing nothing. Oh, my friends, he is as a roaring lion in this world going forth seeking whom he may devour. And I want to warn you that even the ministers of Satan can appear as ministers of God. Satan himself can appear as an angel of light and a minister of God. 
What saith the word? What does the word of God say? And ye that would cast stones and cast doubt upon this here King James Bible, we receive it as the word of God, cover to cover, every bit of it. And we believe it. And these flimsy excuses, the wickedness of men who want to cast it down, and so we, we got to try to find it out there. It's still lost in antiquity. It's still out there in the old uh, Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. And we're still trying to find it. If you want to believe that foolishness, I feel sorry for you. But we have the Word of God. We've had it in this English language for over 400 years now. God has blessed this book above and beyond all others combined. That cannot compare. It's the benchmark. It's the example by which they all compare themselves to. And anybody can have this common sense would know that this is what everybody wants to be. They want to be here. They want to be like this book. They want their new Bibles, their new translation to be like this book, to be so well received and acknowledged that it's the Word of God. But how can two walk together except they be agreed? My friends, don't tell me there's not confusion in your churches when you have a multitude of translations and you read through the Bibles or your Bibles and one says this and another says that and someone else says even something different. Don't tell me that's of God. It's not. God is not a God of confusion and he would speak unto us say, say ye the same thing. Say the same things that I told my prophets, my teachers, my apostles, those who have delivered unto us the word of God, who have given us this message which is before us to look unto God, look unto his Son, and the Holy Spirit of God shows us, and Jesus himself shows us the Father. My friends, if you deny Christ, you can't be saved. He's the only way. And if you then turn around and deny his father, you can't be saved either. We've already showed you that in scriptures. You cannot deny the son. You cannot deny the relationship of the son to the father. Doing either one will condemn you. And until you accept these basic teachings of the word of God, that the father, God the father, sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ into this world to suffer and die for you, to redeem you from all your sins. Put your full faith and trust in Him. And it is that Holy Spirit that quickens and makes you alive and gives you that gift of faith that you can believe upon Him and trust Him. It's all of the Lord, not of anything that we can say, do, or work as it were. At least we would boast then. It's all of God. My friends, we that are saved have a great responsibility to be witnesses to those round about us in this life, to show forth a Christ-like example. And one who's a babe in Christ is not going to be able to do that as well as someone who's more mature and well trained and taught by the Word of God. But it's a goal that we should all strive for. And with what level of experience and ability we have that we use it for the glory of God. My friends, we pray that as we continue looking at these things in the months to come, that God will help to strengthen the faith of those who are looking to these things and following along. May God strengthen your faith in Him and His only begotten Son. And may He keep you, my friends, until we meet again.